You are heading to a coffee shop in your town. As you walk in, you feel people staring. A feeling of being on a stage overtakes you. You go and order a cup of coffee. You're asked what you would like and you're a bit unsure. And as you think about it, you genuinely believe that the cashier knows your entire story. You think he's paying attention to every detail about you. You think the person behind you in line is as well. You hope you don't do something to embarrass yourself like dropping your wallet, stuttering, or looking awkward. You get your coffee and you go and sit down. Now you think others in the cafe are noticing you sitting there, your outfit, your hair that day, and so much more. In that split moment, you take out your phone to go on social media. You're reminded of the past. You create an image of what people from the past think of you based on your social media presence. Your mind reminds you of an endeavor that you want to pursue, but everyone is living in your mind, so you procrastinate on it. Parents, siblings, exes, strangers, people from college, in high school, current friends, acquaintances. You leave the coffee shop and the spotlight continually follows you. The imaginary audience says, what are they going to do next? What if I told you that the imaginary audience is all a mind game and that it's exactly its name, imaginary? Let's talk about it. The imaginary audience is quite the phenomenon and I think it's such an important thing that's not talked about enough. And it's a phenomenon that holds so many people back in life, whether someone wants to move towards a purpose of theirs or a profession, or they want to get into a certain type of relationship, or they have certain health goals, they want to travel certain places. There's a demographic of people that lives in the minds of people that dictates their every move in life. It's almost like a spotlight that's put onto you. And as, it's as if you're being watched by an audience. And this audience feels so real. It's people you know, it's people you don't know, it's acquaintances, it's friends, it's exes, it's it's so many people that you your your mind convinces you that these people are paying attention to you a lot. But the biggest news flash and and what you're gonna internalize in this video is that no one's paying attention to you as close as you think they are. And in this video, I'm gonna break down why. I'm gonna break down how your mind is tricking you. I'm gonna break down how this trick of the mind is causing you anxiety, it's causing you procrastination, it's causing you fear, it's causing you low self-esteem. And we're gonna get into ways to mitigate the imaginary audience. Now, what is the imaginary audience to begin with? Like, what does that even mean? I'll start with my definition. The imaginary audience is a demographic of people that live in your mind rent-free. Like I said, this can include parents, siblings, friends, lovers, acquaintances, people from the past, strangers. And you have a belief that they're focusing so intently on your life and that they, they care about every single detail. And later in this video, I'm gonna talk about some cognitive biases that contribute to the phenomenon of the imaginary audience. But one of the biggest ones is confirmation bias where you focus on instances only of people paying attention to you and then you broaden that out and you say, oh, my cousin noticed that, that I did this and they talk, they talk to me about it and now everyone else probably wants to talk to me about it. So now you have the spotlight and in a way the ego gets gratification, low key gets gratification from being recognized, but the ego can't shake this and it leads to things like social anxiety. It leads to you being robotic, where you think everyone's seeing your every move and you don't want to come across awkward or you don't want to come across strange or something. I'm going to touch more on that later in this video. The imaginary audience is a feeling that whatever you do or say is the primary focus of other people's attention. This leads to the sense that you are under the close, constant observation of others. Teenagers often will be extremely sensitive to this sensation and tend to be overly focused on whether they're doing even low stakes tasks right. And they will feel like others are watching them and judging them. Think about low stakes tasks like walking, biking, moving your arms, small stuff. When other people do low stakes tasks, are you that intently paying attention to those little tasks? No, you're focused on yourself. <laughs> and I really want to hit home in this video the importance of understanding that we're all in our own world. And because everyone's in their own world, it makes sense that they don't have the mental focus for you to be their world. 
because you're not their world. They're their world. To them, you are a part of their world, whether you're a stranger, whether you're a family, whether you're friends, whether you're in a relationship, but you're not the sole intent. You're not the sole focus. No, because humans, yes, we're social creatures, but we are inherently also selfish. We look for our best interests. We look for our safety needs. We look to meet our needs constantly. If we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have all these needs that a given human tends to want to meet, especially the lower needs. If a human is spending all their time trying to meet all these needs, they're working, they're going to exercise, they're meeting up with this friend, they're worried about this problem, they're going here, going there, they want to watch this show, all this stuff. Even if they're so close to you, they're not going to remember that time when you were awkward. They're truly not going to care about you doing this with your life, you doing that with your life. The fact that you are the most important person in your universe, you think you're the most important person to everyone else's universe. When you understand this topic that you aren't the center of attention, this is liberating. It gives you reign to be awkward and be okay with being awkward, quote unquote, whatever your idea of awkward is. I wanna stay in the topic of adolescence in the teenage years. When you're a child before your teenage years, you naturally are very curious about the world and you're developing your sense of self. These are the developmental stages of your of your life and you're just you're just you you just are you're more in just a being state your ego isn't really fully developed yet you're still learning who you are as you get closer into adolescence you start to develop an identity you start to develop a separate identity from your parents and your family you start to notice that wow okay this is my name this is me this is what i like this is what i dislike that over there is my mom and my dad etc my siblings, etc. We share the same blood, but I am me. I have my, my own tastes and things like that, right? So from the physical plane, we see sep you, you notice your separation and you start creating identities. Your identity is starting to form. However, you still have a need for belonging to a degree. And in the teenage years, this is absolutely apparent. There's a sense of individuation where you wanna be your own person away from your family, right? But you also need a sense of belonging that gives you confidence in this identity of yours. So you may gravitate towards a certain friend group, certain sports, etc., etc. Now, in this stage in life, you're very hyper vigilant on disapproval. On average, most people are. Why? Because you don't want to be shunned, right? You don't want to not fit in. You don't want to lack that social support to a degree. There's a sense of self-esteem in the teenage years of having a friend group, of having people that approve of you. So naturally, what starts to happen is an imaginary audience starts to form for most people, right? You start to make sure that you are keeping up appearances, that you are in line with the ego you've presented to other people. And, you know, you, you start to notice maybe people start disapproving of you and it hits home a little bit harder, right? So this now teaches you that people are paying attention to you all the time, which... Again, it's a confirmation bias, and I'll get into that soon. But that's where it starts. But a lot of people, as they mature, they hold on to this imaginary audience. There's not enough expansion going on to start putting this imaginary audience into perspective and seeing it as something that's just really non-existent. You're still in a sense of competing, in a sense of what will this person from high school think? What will this person from my college class think? What will this ex think, et cetera? But going back to what I talked about earlier, <laughs> everyone's in their own universe. That person that made fun of you in high school or whatever, they probably forgot about that. That was like one instance in, in high school. Yet to you, you carry that on with you throughout your life. And you think that person still is uh, paying attention to you a lot? No, they probably don't even remember it. It's, it's an illusion. It's all in the mind. And I can tell you that intellectually, but that's not enough. You have to see instances of it being an illusion. You have to see instances where people just aren't paying attention as much to you. And there's a lot of instances of that. One of the biggest things that exacerbates the imaginary audience is social media. How we're connected, our online page is this online persona of us and we think it's being constantly judged and people are fixated on this page. So the man that coined the term imaginary audience was David Elkind. He was a child and developmental psychologist. Quote, as a young man, David Elkine spent many years working in family courts and noticed that kids who got in trouble were often trying to impress a perceived audience of people paying attention to their every move. He began to study this and he found the notion that others were watching was tied to 
kids' emotional development. When adolescents get their new abilities, they are able to think about thinking. It's a second age of reason, if you will. And one of the capacities they have now is to think about other people's thinking. So that's why I alluded to when you're first developing, you're in that first stage of thinking, right? You're thinking about the world and you're noticing things and taking things in. As you get a little bit older, you start to understand that these are other, you know, humans and beings that think as well. You get their opinions, you get their feedback on things, and you notice that these people have a way of thinking. And then you naturally think, okay, how do they think about me? Adolescents are going through rapid changes with their bodies, emotions, roles in the world, and they think a lot about themselves during that time period. When they wonder about what others are thinking, they return to themselves and come to the conclusion they must be thinking what I'm thinking about me. Mm. And this is such a false consensus, right? Because like I said, you are in your universe, you are in your body at all times. Naturally, you have so many survival pressures, you have likes, dislikes, so many things that you push on, out onto the world. And I'm gonna add more about this later in this video, but this is called the false consensus effect. Thinking that other people think just like you. That's the cognitive bias that contributes to the imaginary audience. You may think that your hair, for example, doesn't look good and you're walking out in public and people are noticing how bad your hair is. But to somebody else, they probably like your hair. It's a relative notion, good hair, bad hair. I had, I've had instances where I was getting ready. Uh, my girlfriend and I were gonna head somewhere and you know, she check her hair a lot she has great hair. And I tell her, I'm like, your hair looks amazing. But to her, it's like, you know, there's some fixes there. But when you're out in public, how often do you notice people's hairs? There's so many people out there right now in public, they're having a bad hair day. But you look at their hair and you're like, in fact, if you, if you notice their hair at all, you look at it and you're like, you don't think much of it, maybe. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But guess what, even if you don't like their hair, <laughs> are you gonna be thinking about their hair in a day? In two days, you're not. You have your own stuff you, you wanna deal with. You have to go to the doctor's office, you gotta go to work, you got to pay this bill, you got to um, go hang out with this friend, you have a trip to plan, you have all this stuff. All these survival needs and, and esteem needs that are above other people. Why? Because there's a degree of egocentrism with you. And the other person that's feeling like you're judging them, that's egocentric as well. And you're both being egocentric. I kind of argue it's not a psychological aberration as it might be in an adult. Rather, it's a natural part of the process of developing a healthy understanding of one's relationship with the world. Most people will eventually gain a more realistic perspective on the roles they play in their peer groups as they mature. This is this part I kind of agree, but I kind of disagree with him. Because with the advent of social media nowadays and how interconnected we are, I, th I feel as though the imaginary audience is more prevalent than we think, especially with most adults, right? I don't think most people shake it at all, even as they mature. There's always an inkling of it in the background and that, and that makes sense, but you don't want that imaginary audience being there hindering you. For instance, if you're looking to start a business and you have somewhat of an imaginary audience, but you're still taking action and creating that business and moving forward with it, you're not always fixated on the past and people, people's opinions, that's perfectly fine. Like you kind of have it there, but it's not getting in the way. However, if it's there and it's, you're paralyzed by your dad's opinion of you having this business, how, oh, he's gonna think that it's not gonna be sustainable for my future, all this stuff. Now this is a problem. Okay, now you have to deconstruct that. Like, okay, he may not approve of it now, but what if I start and it does become successful? Will he come around to it? Probably. Okay, what if he doesn't come around, but it's successful? Is that still good? Yeah, I mean, that's still great. So it's all about questioning this stuff. A lot of times in our psyches, we don't question what's coming across and we're just asleep to it. And we take it as truth. We take people's opinions on things, people's opinions on us as truth rather than perspective. There's a, a big difference. Perspective and truth are not the same thing. Quote, some people become obsessed with personal appearance, with results ranging from harmless emotional crises over acne breakouts to potentially life-threatening eating disorders. Others will fixate on a particular peer group, imagining that members of that group are judging their actions or seeking approval from people who are in reality are just clueless 
teens like themselves. I'll say teens slash adults. These events can, can seem traumatic to those who have little life experience. Emphasis on imagine, right? When we think about the imaginary audience, we're imagining scenarios. We're imagining people's gossiping. We are imagining people's opinions, right? And when you imagine things, especially when it evokes an emotion within you, your body and mind take that more seriously. It's made this emotional impact on you. This is something, this is something to pay attention to, especially if this imaginary audience is inspiring a degree of anxiety within you. How does, how do we react to anxiety? Like, okay, what's the threat? We scan for the threat and we try to get away from that threat. It's almost like a fight or flight mode with the imaginary audience. If you allow these pictured scenarios, which aren't necessarily real, but you base them off the past and you bring them to the present, you're like, this is probably how the person is going to respond to it. You're now in a lower consciousness state, like maybe you fear and all of that, maybe some anxiety, etc. Now you're paralyzed and you moving towards that goal or that thing you want to do, that imaginary audience is putting you in a state of where that, that thing seems dangerous now. Why? Because the tribe potentially could disapprove of you when you do that. I really want you to understand just how egocentric but tribal we, all, we, we are as humans. It's, it's really interesting. You're a self-preservation machine and you're preserving yourself both on a social level because having social connections leads to a higher likelihood of survival but also from a standpoint of not feeling bad or not feeling endangered by being potentially disapproved of. So what, per what perpetuates the imaginary audience, right? What keeps this going? You have social media, of course, our interconnected society, people seeing your story, people looking at your posts. You, you kind of have that exposure. Well, what people think of this photo, that photo, does this look nice, does that look nice? And when in reality, people probably look at it, maybe they give it a like and then they keep scrolling. And then they think about their photo, like, oh, there's people, do they like, oh, they, they got more followers than me. Da, da, da. It's all a mind game. Another thing is what you've been told directly or indirectly, right? So if you grow up, growing up, your mom said, hey, dress nice because people are going to be there and everyone's going to notice your outfit, all this stuff. An example of indirectly is how a, a parent or caregiver behaved. I remember growing up when we we had guests, my mom would make sure the house was spotless. And I'm all for providing a great, you know, experience, but I mean, she was frantic with it, <laughs> right? Um, because there's a certain impression she wanted to give off. Also with how we dressed and how we greeted guests and all of this stuff. Sure, it is nice, but but it can get over the top a little bit. Another thing that can perpetuate the imaginary audience is how how strongly you internalize people's worldviews. If you have an opinionated friend, how closely you internalize that friend's opinion of you in the world. And now he starts living in your mind rent free. And whenever you do stuff, it's like your friend is talking to you through your mind. And you have no authentic voice. There's no separation. It's like just because this person has a stronger worldview or frame around something, it should cloud yours, which isn't true. You have to think authentically of, okay, how do what do I think of this situation? What about me in a healthier sense rather than, oh, what about me? Look at all these people paying attention to me. <laughs> I actually have a story. On Monday, I was at the gym and I, I was wrapping up my gym with, the, with, with some, some sprinting. And I got on the treadmill and I put my phone, you know, on the treadmill and I put my gym jacket uh, on top of my phone or something like that. And then I started running, running really fast. Usain Bolt style, you know me. I'm fast. Anyways. <laughs> so after I'm done with my sprint, I noticed my phone is gone. So I'm like, where'd my phone go? Like what happened? It was just here. My music ends, right? And, and all of that, or it pauses or something. So I'm like, okay, let me just look for my phone. And I'm looking for it. I'm looking around the treadmill to the next treadmill, the other treadmill next on the other side. I'm looking under the treadmill, right? I'm pressing the button to like incline it up so that I can look for my phone and see where it is. And as I'm doing it, I'm noticing a subtle, um, subtly I'm noticing, okay, oh wow, there's like, are people paying attention to me looking for my phone? Like subtly, not even close to how I would, would in the past. Because my, the old me would be like, oh, you know, everyone's looking at me probably. And they're like, oh, look at this guy. He lost his phone and oh, he's clumsy. <laughs> so all these, my old self would have thought of all this stuff. 
Me now, I'm just like, where's my phone? Like my focus and intent was on the phone. And then guess what? As I'm walking around looking for my phone, I sometimes glance up and look around. No one cares. Everyone's doing their workout. Everyone's focused on them. People are on their phones. People are lifting stuff. People are walking in and out the gym. Even the workers there, they're doing stuff. So I'm like, wow, like nobody cares. Like what, wait, what is social anxiety anyways? Nobody cares as much as you even think. So I'm looking for my phone, can't find it. I go to one of the workers and I say, hey, um, can you help me look for my phone? Or maybe we could look at the surveillance camera, see if someone stole it or something. And uh, he's like, oh, I can't access the surveillance, but hey, we can do the find my iPhone thing. And we do it on the computer. And then, uh, you know, he turns down the music in the gym. And then um, so, so we can hear my phone buzzing. And we eventually hear it and we get it. It turns out my phone fell on the treadmill and the treadmill like pushed it back because it was, it was moving, pushed it back into under one of the treadmills behind it. So we found it. And, and in fact, I skipped a part. I would go up and ask people, can you call my phone so I could find it? They're like, sure. There wasn't really a judgment there. There wasn't a, oh, look at this guy. He needs me to call. No, it was like, yeah, sure. Of course. Oh, sorry to hear that. Sure. That person that called my phone, he was helping, but it, you know, we, we, we still couldn't hear it from there. Find my iPhone thing helped. But guess what? After that workout, do you think he's still thinking about, oh yeah, there's, you know, that guy that asked him to call his phone, he's not thinking about that. He has other stuff he's focused on. So there's not this spotlight of attention. Everyone's focused on themselves very intently. Like I said, they're focused on their needs. They're focused on their survival needs. They're focused on their esteem needs. Where attention goes, energy flows. The longer you pay attention to something, it's an it's a, it's a opportunity cost of you paying attention to something else. If a human has so many drives and things to do, especially in adulthood, they don't have the time to add so much energy, attention towards you. And even when they add energy, attention towards you, it's not for that long. And when you're conversating with someone and you feel a little awkward, there are things you perceive as awkward that they may not perceive as awkward. And if they perceive it as awkward, they're not gonna keep it in their mind for that long. Another example, my YouTube channel. I do tend to go pretty deep with stuff and I tend to trigger some people. Right. But I'm trying to present truth to people. And if you get triggered by that, then, you know, you, it's good to investigate that. I remember when my channel was, you know, taking off and, you know, like there are people in my life that absolutely, you know, they support what I do. They love what I do. Like, it's awesome. Especially my mom. She like she she loves that I'm doing YouTube. Even my mom. <laughs> She's like, that's great. But it's still like, hey, we have to go to this family thing <laughs> next week. Like, hey, can you stop by to pick up some food? <laughs> she knows that I do YouTube and like, you know, I have a quote unquote big channel, but even then, so what? She's, there's still some needs that she needs to focus on. Now, if I were to paralyze myself and not create a YouTube channel years ago because of the potential imaginary audience, you wouldn't be watching this video and I wouldn't be where I am today. If you think about the things that you wanna do in your life, you're going to have people that have their opinions on it, sure. But they still have their life and they're not going to be focused. It's going to be a new norm, basically. So you might as well do it. And guess what? Even if you fail at something, since it didn't turn out that big, the failure doesn't matter. And if it does turn out big and you fail, you still learn a lot of things. So you might as well do it. Whether you fail or win at whatever you want to do, people are going to notice it and they're going to be like, okay, that's cool and then focus on themselves again. Humans are so predictable. When you understand the psychology of humans, you understand how predictable we all are. This is the spotlight effect and how social anxiety affects us when we're not careful. Quote, think back to how easily embarrassed you were as a teenager. If you wore the wrong shirt, quote unquote, to school, it felt like everybody was gossiping about you and your entire social life would end as a result. Resulting in perpetual self-consciousness distorted views of how others saw you causing a tendency to conform for a fear of sticking out. So we talked about the social elements that we need as humans, especially, you know, growing up. And as you individuate, you look for a circle of people that can be kind of in your social tribe. And if they don't approve of you, 
it can feel isolating, right? And it builds to a degree of self-consciousness. And now you carry that self-consciousness and now you don't want to stick out. The imaginary audience is keeping you stuck. It limits your freedom, your expression, and you're just very limited. But at the end of the day, it's all an illusion. The story we tell ourselves about the imaginary audience is what David Elkind describes as the personal fable, right? Think of a fable, a story. The main character has a story. You're the main character. And you create this story around your life. And you may exacerbate it a little bit. And it gives a sense of importance. Part of the imaginary audience is also assuming people's reactions, right? You base it off the past. My uncle would think this, they'd react like this, they'd react like that. And you may be right, but again, so what? What is the threat you're perceiving by these reactions? What is it? How bad can it get? Think about that. How bad could it be? It's literally almost never as bad as you think. Watch my overthinking video if you need more um, background on that. Another insight I want you to know is that you don't need to be consistent with your past self. One of the things I noticed within myself was that when I would um, meet extended family or go to Senegalese community events and all of that, I'm Senegalese, you know, I, I, I noticed a sense of me trying to be consistent with my younger self of what people know me as, right? How I was when I was young, etc. But that's not me anymore. Why do I need to be consistent with that? Just because that's people's first impressions of me. No, I've changed. So they should have the impression of me changing because I have. I'm a man now. I'm smarter. I look different. I'm taller. I am so many things. I got this going on, this going on. So I need to express that. So you don't need to be consistent with your past self because you're not a static being. You're ever changing. <sighs> Had to turn the light on because it gets darker in the winter time, but continuing on. Let's talk about how the imaginary audience holds you back, right? Because this really will hit home that you need to work on this when you understand the downsides, the pain behind it. Firstly, procrastination. Overthinking and procrastination is a sign that there are multiple or corresponding or opposite ideas in your mind. And you have to ask yourself, where are these ideas that are opposite to what I want to do coming from? Is it, am I being objective and I'm looking at multiple angles of me going towards this area, doing this in my life or behaving like this? Or is it someone living in my mind rent free with their feedback opinion and I'm afraid that their feedback or opinion will make me feel a certain way? Then you have to break that down further and question it because you want to question everything. So procrastination. Oh, this person will think I'm better than them if I want, if I do this. So what? Their insecurity is making you procrastinate or their perceived insecurity or you thinking they'll be insecure about you elevating in a certain way. This was like a strange phenomenon I kind of had in my mind. Like, oh, some people in my life will think I am better than them by me starting my business or me growing this and that or me getting in great shape when it wasn't even close to the truth. It was a story, it was a fable. Next, the imaginary audience holds you back through distraction and over self-consciousness. You're focused on these potential reactions and people, and it builds a degree of self-consciousness, a degree of hesitancy, a lack of flow. Because what is flow? What is being in the present moment? It's I'm just being, I'm doing. When you're in your head, now there's a blockage of flow. You're not present, you're not flowing, you're 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 up here and you're trying to anticipate the future, you're thinking about the past. And this becomes a distraction from the most important things. Keep that in mind. Next, low self-esteem, a lower opinion of yourself, especially if you have a negative, a negative imaginary audience. You're still internalizing what someone said to you in the past, and you take that as truth instead of a perspective, like how I mentioned, truth and perspective is not the same thing. Here's an interesting quote around women when it comes to the imaginary audience, because it turns out by research that women are actually more susceptible than men on average to get sucked into the imaginary audience. Quote, several theoretical perspectives suggest that girls are more strongly socialized to 
toward concern with external appearance. We suggest that the development of an imaginary audience focused on the transient or outward features of the self reflects a process through which such concerns are internalized. Elkine and Bowen reported that girls scored more highly than boys on both the abiding and transient self-measures. However, we saw no theoretical reason to predict on the scores of abiding self between boys and girls. In addition, we expected no differences between boys and girls in public individuation. Well, women tend to deal with the imaginary audience a little harder because they're told to appease others a bit more. Also, they're told that their, their appearance is a big measure of their value. And because of that, it's not uncommon for certain women to, you know, make sure their appearance is up to par, isn't uh, judged, especially in negative context. But we have to think about a woman's survival strategy, right? What is a woman's survival strategy? A woman's survival strategy hinges on a degree of social approval and connections. From a primitive standpoint, if a woman doesn't have a tribe around her, other men and women, to confide in or to be protected by, her chances of long-term survival are slim. So a woman's ability to socialize, build connections, build community is important for her sense of feeling valued, but also a sense of protection. It makes sense that this imaginary audience would be more prevalent within women if we put a man and a woman on an island, on two separate islands, and we say, you know, survive on your own. There's an instance where it may be tougher for the women, not in all instances, could be an instance where the woman survives fine and the man doesn't. But for the most part, if we take it into consideration what women deal with biologically, especially when it comes to bodily pains and um, things that do take time uh, to work through without protection during those times of pain, especially let's say this woman is potentially giving birth at some point, etc., that's dangerous and that's tough. Those are harsher conditions. But if she has a community where she's built social bonds, etc., it'd be way easier for her to survive and her children. I'm gonna get into takeaways very soon, but first I wanna talk about the cognitive biases that contribute to the imaginary audience. First, the spotlight effect. The tendency to overestimate how much other people notice about us. In other words, we tend to think there is a spotlight on us at all times, highlighting our mistakes or flaws for all the world to see. You can do a simple thought experiment you can take a stranger or you can take a friend of yours and you can imagine them to have a spotlight effect on them. And now you look at your vantage point and you think to yourself, how often do you truly pay attention to them? Probably not as much as they think you do. It's the same with you. Next, confirmation bias. Focusing only on instances of people paying attention to you and using that as evidence that everyone is paying attention to you. Right, so you take a few people, maybe you take your friends, etc. Now you think everyone else is the same way. This leads to the next thing, which is false consensus bias. Thinking everyone has the same conclusion about you, right? Based off maybe a small sample size of what you, where you're getting that data from, right? Your friends, etc. or whatever. Or that stranger that noticed your shirt. And now every stranger is going to notice your shirt. Another example with the false consensus effect is thinking that what you find awkward, other, other people find awkward. For example, if you stutter on your words, maybe you view that as awkward. Someone else may not. I don't find that as awkward when someone stutters, not at all. So it's relative, but we take our vantage point and we assume our relative vantage point is the case for everybody else. Here's a helpful cognitive bias when it comes to the imaginary audience. I do wanna throw this one in. This is called the Pygmalion effect. When people have high expectations of us, it can lead to better performance. For example, you playing basketball with a friend group and your friends are watching you play, you're probably more likely to play better because they have certain expectations of you and you wanna, you wanna meet those expectations so it elevates you to a degree, right? It's not really dragging you down, it's helping you be better. Uh, another example is your relationship. If you and your significant other have high, high standards for each other, you're more likely to elevate your life because of that higher standard. So it's a very positive thing. They're, them being in the back of your mind keeps you grounded, right? They're almost like a muse. So that's a good way to kind of use the imaginary audience. If there's people in your life that bring value to you and they're there for you, they support you well. You elevating in this thing 
because of their positive expectations, you're more likely to be better. But if they have high expectations of you and you're afraid of not living up to it, that's a whole nother story, right? What I'm talking about is there's a sense of you being okay with not living up to it, but you aim to live up to it. That's an important nuance. At the end of the day, this is all about authenticity and showing your truth to the world. Because there are people that are similar to you, but by you shying away from the world, they're not gonna see their similarities with you. When we are authentic, people recognize that authenticity, despite whoever's in that perceived imaginary audience, which we know is an illusion. This is why I love rap music so much. A lot of rappers I listen to, they have this bravado and this, this is me, this is who I am. You're being authentic, you're, you're, you're showing your truth, and you're like, the right people will gravitate towards me and the wrong people will be repelled by me, perfect. And I understand that the judgments people make are, a, are, are from where they're coming from, is, from, is based on their past, is based off their upbringing, is based off their beliefs, is based off all this stuff. I can't control that. All I can control is me being me. So that's what I like about the music I listen to. Go ahead and judge me. This is who I am, this is what I do, judge me. Because you're gonna do it anyways. So I might as well be me. Let's get into takeaways. First, no one cares. Humans are inherently selfish in terms of what they pay attention to and for how long. Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and um, the different needs of a human, especially going into adulthood where they have less time, they have other things to focus on. In the teenage years, teenagers have more time, etc. they have time to goof off, all that stuff. However, at such a small point of your life, and even then, still, no one's paying attention to you as much as you think. Next, no one has as much context about you as you do. You can't shape perception as much as you think. There's a thousand conclusions someone can have about you from first meeting you that you can't control. Maybe they had a bad day and they see you smile and they hate you because you're smiling. <laughs> you can't control that. The perception is always lacking because we make quick judgments. We don't know, the, the person doesn't know your story. They don't know your upbringing. They don't know what you've gone through but you assume that they, they do. Even if it's people you know, there's still context they don't have. You, have. you have the most context about yourself. Lastly, adopt positive nihilism. Positive nihilism is understanding that nothing matters and that's beautiful and that's great. This is especially important if, you, if it's hard for you to, to, to understand that the imaginary audience is an illusion. Let's say these people are all, like all this attention is very real to me. In a hundred years, it's not gonna matter. And that's what makes life beautiful. That means I can do anything I want because in this timeline, this timeline, this timeline, I'm not gonna remember any of this, it's not gonna matter. And I can be in the present moment, I can be joyful, I can appreciate life, I can expand. 